Hey, hey, what is going on? <clears throat> Hope everyone is doing well on, I think it's Tuesday, Tuesday. So over the next two days, we are going to read an article about the Tulsa massacre. And uh, yesterday, hopefully you were in class, we watched a short seven minute documentary on what led up to the whole um, just violent episode. So, I mean, hopefully you have a good idea of what led up to it. But in my opinion, there's no real substitute to reading about what happened. I know you probably don't want to hear that, but when you get to high school or college, like I learn a lot from YouTube. I really, I watch a lot of YouTube. Last night I watched a, a whole thing on the Ukraine, Russia thing. I think it was called like infographics or something like that. It was a really good, it was kind of a cartoon thing. So it gave me an understanding of what would happen if Russia and Ukraine went to war. Really good stuff. But just when you read it, usually the author will go into way more detail. And when you get into high school and if you choose to go to college, that's going to be a major way that you will get your information is like through reading, not as much through video. I'm not saying there will be none. I mean, it's a great, it's a great way, but it's the reading that really gets down deep into it. <clears throat> Authors will usually take more time than uh, somebody making a movie. So if you want to gain an edge over other students, I know this is middle school and it may sound lame, but try to commit yourself to reading 10, 30 minutes a day at the very least. Those students who do that, I think will have far better chances uh, in high school and beyond. So try to get into that habit of reading. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so, it's so good in so many ways. Uh, we used to read in class every day. We just, our classes are too short. We used to read like 15 minutes every day. It was great. I loved it. I read more when we did that, but we just don't, we don't have the time. So today we're going to read together. Hopefully you will, as usual, hopefully I will be reading the text. Hopefully you'll be looking at the text. There will be a couple, I mean, this is a hard text, by the way. I think it's listed as seventh grade, but it, it seems like eighth or ninth grade to me. It's, it's pretty challenging. Hopefully I don't mess up on any of this stuff. So this is the article from Newzella. And you can see, let me just get rid of myself here. You can see the title. Tulsa's Black Wall Street flourished as a self-contained hub in early 1900s. So even in that title, you, you have to know what Wall Street is. So that's a place in New York City where lots and lots of money is exchanged. Stock market, Wall Street, lots of banks there. Self-contained. That means uh, it doesn't need any help from the outside. Self-contained. Uh, let's see. Maybe we should look at a, this picture here. Can I make it bigger? And this will say it's a, a bird's eye view of Tulsa in 1918. So, you know, you got some, look at that. Look, some skyscrapers there. Not bad. I had no idea. A river ran through Tulsa, Oklahoma. When I think of Oklahoma, I think of uh, pretty dry. There you go. And a note before teaching, this is uh, obviously to teachers, not to you, but it is worth looking at. There might be some sensitive content here. So it's not horrible, but um, I mean, they. <clears throat> what happens is horrible, but uh, thankfully they don't go into like a whole bunch of detail. So there is a trigger warning, but I think we're all good. I've, I've read the article. Some horrible violence happens. I mean, I think we all know that. Uh, luckily, they don't go into graphic detail on the subject. Right. Back to the article. In the focus of this article right here, Greenwood, it's a district of Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is one of the wealthiest and most successful black communities in the United States in the early 1900s. 
bustling Greenwood Avenue, commonly known as Black Wall Street, thrived as a center of Black American business and culture. On May 31st, 1921, hundreds of Black residents were killed in the Tulsa Race Massacre. Greenwood was attacked by a white mob that burned down the neighborhood over two days of violence. This devastating event, one of the worst episodes of racial violence in the U.S., often overshadows the history of the community itself. So basically what that, <clears throat> excuse me, what that uh, piece of the article is saying is that the violence is what is most known about this community. But don't forget, it was thriving. There were a lot of businesses um, owned by black owners that this was uncommon in other parts of the country in 1921. So unfortunately, it all came to an end because of um, what I would say, jealous, jealousy. All right. <clears throat> Built on indigenous ground. So we're going to get into a little bit of what you talked about in Mr. Bim's class right here. Indigenous lands, probably a good place for me to stop. Uh, what do you think? Indigenous land. I'll pause here. And if you are at home, hopefully someone in class said indigenous, that would be uh, like Native American land. Greenwood was founded in 1906 on land that was once called Indian Territory. The U.S. government used the area as a place to forcibly resettle indigenous Americans in the early 1800s. Today, that area encompasses much of eastern Oklahoma. And I do believe you have talked about the Indian Removal Act. The president I most associate this with is Andrew Jackson. He was not the only person. Uh, it's just like uh, we'll be talking about the, the Holocaust later on in uh, like the fourth quarter. And a lot of times with the Holocaust, you think, oh, Hitler, he was the if it wasn't for him, this would have never happened. And when you think of Indian Removal Act, you you might think of Jackson as the one guy, right? But there were thousands, tens of thousands of people that thought, yeah, this was a good thing. That's the scary part. Like no one person can be responsible. Like there has to be a lot of other people that are like, yeah, this is good. Taking people from their land. And if you think about Oklahoma, and that was for a long time, like the, the state, where if you're a Native American, the government probably forced you to live. It's not easy. We would probably call that inhospitable. Weather's not great. It's dry. So that's what the U.S. government did was uh, forced Native Americans to live on pretty crappy land that nobody else wanted. And this is what they're saying. This is part of where Greenwood, uh, what Greenwood was used for until you know native americans were probably either killed or, or kicked off that land as well some let's see find my place here some indigenous tribes enslaved black people after they had become free, free some black people integrated i can never say that word right integrated integrated one of our words from last last week into tribal communities these former enslaved people acquired allotted land in Greenwood through the Dawes Act. Okay. Mr. Bim says you talked about this briefly. And if you don't, this is the great thing about most articles. If you don't know what the Dawes Act is, well, just keep reading. It's a law that gave land to individual indigenous Americans. Okay. That's actually pretty hard to say right there, individual indigenous Americans. That's what the Dawes Act did. It Because so much land was taken away from Native Americans, the Dawes Act said, hey, okay, well, I know we took your land. Um, take this crappy land instead. Many black sharecroppers, we've talked about sharecroppers as well in here. Remember, uh, just I'll pause it in case anybody remembers sharecroppers. Pause. All right. So sharecroppers, just hopefully I'm just saying what somebody else said in class. This was the name for people who were former slaves. Remember, 
1865, slavery was abolished. But it wasn't so easy. It wasn't just like people were leaving the land. Oh, great. I can go into the city and get a job. Like there was no money. There was no education. So what happened for many, many years, maybe a couple generations after, is that a lot of times former slaves would just stay on the land, work the land, give a huge percentage to the owner of that land, probably a former slave owner. And, you know, they would still be stuck. Former slaves would still be stuck in this like kind of cycle of like no money, just working. I mean, of course, they could come and go as they pleased, but there wasn't really anything to go to. So that's what sharecroppers were. All right, back to this uh, article here. We're going pretty slow because I think it's kind of difficult. Many black sharecroppers fleeing racial oppression relocated to the region as well. They were looking for a better life after the end of the Civil War. So for those people that could afford, they could somehow raise the money they could move to this region. Oklahoma began to be promoted as a safe haven for African-Americans who start to come to Indian territory, says Michelle Place. Well, who the heck is this? Where'd she come from? Well, if you look, just keep reading. The article hopefully will tell you. Oh, Place is an executive director of the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. The largest number of black townships after the Civil War were located in Oklahoma. So I think we've talked about the Great Migration here. If we haven't, let's just briefly talk about that. We have. I know we have. We, we, we talked about it with the... Um, it was it my Angelou? My Angelou stuff. Um, <clears throat> so the Great Migration, this happened after the Civil War about like 40 years after, once there was a generation of freed former slaves and, and their, their children, there might have been enough money for like some way to get up to um, out of the South. So cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, it would be a place where like if you were living in the South, I mean, obviously, if you were black, you were not treated at all equally you could go to the north still face tons of racism but at least you would have more freedom you, there weren't uh jim crow laws jim crow laws we've talked quite a bit about that but it was the the laws that segregated the races you know made people who were black feel less like a person and more like an animal you know, hey oh you need to go to the bathroom yeah well down the street, back entrance, it's going to be dirty. You know, that's what it was all designed to do. Make people who are black feel less than. All right, the next one here. Between 1865 and 1920, black Americans founded more than 50 black townships in the state. O.W. Gurley, this guy, I don't know if anybody's a football fan. I don't know if he is a... Uh, a forefather for Todd Gurley, a very famous running back in the NFL, went to Georgia. Probably not. But he was mentioned in the uh, movie yesterday. O.W. Gurley, a wealthy black landowner, purchased 40 acres of land in Tulsa. He named it Greenwood after the town in Mississippi. All right, this is very slow reading. So what do you say? We stop here. We continue tomorrow, but I think if we, you know, we kept pressing on, there was a lot of new information here. So call it a day, stop it there. We'll pick up tomorrow with, uh, looks like the next part is built, excuse me, for black people by black people. And we'll learn more about uh, O.W. Gurley. All right. Excuse me.